Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. On behalf of MS Society of India and Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to our medical seminar on conquering MS disabilities. Before we get into this session, I'm going to quickly introduce MS Society of India to all of you. Some of you very well know, all of you, many of you are associated with the society, but I'm sure you know we have some new people and new faces around, and it would be good to give a quick round of introduction to the society. The MS Society of India was established in 1985. It's affiliated to the MS International Federation in UK. Uh, we have pan-India presence with our chapters in nine cities in India. Uh, MS is a chronic uh, disease and it's a progressive one of the central nervous system that really makes uh, in many patients uh, even to perform the daily simplest tasks very difficult. The symptoms may vary depending on people. Like you see, it's mentioned on the standee, it could be blurring of vision, it could be numbness, slurred speech, fatigue, it could be cognitive issues, it could be uh, various, uh, you know, other uh, things that could also be uh, leading to paralysis. MS is not contagious, it's not considered hereditary, it is not a mental illness, and it is uh, rarely fatal. So it should not be considered as a social stigma. People with MS, if the disease is managed appropriately with the help of medications and other therapies, uh, can fairly lead a normal life. Uh, while I say that, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Kranti Munje, and I'm an MSP, and I'm also the Joint Secretary for MS Society of India. So I think, you know, I'm a good example of a person with MS who has been leading a very normal life. <clears throat> it's mostly young adults in the age group of 18 and 40 that get impacted by this disease. And this happens at the prime of the age, and this is when the families and the patients really go off track, and it could be a big psychological setback to people. So here is where the MS Society comes into picture. MS Society supports people, the patients, we call them MSPs, uh, supports MSPs and their family families by providing psychological support. We also do physical rehabilitation of uh, the MSPs by providing home physiotherapy, occupational therapy at least thrice a week, uh, and this is where the MS Society spends maximum of its funds every year. We also hold medical camps. We try to give concessional and free MRIs for patients that are needy. We also provide uh, assistance to, medica, uh, to medicines. It could be whether they are steroids or another medications that are required to the patients. We also reimburse medical, uh, we do medical reimbursements as well for patients. We try and also economically rehabilitate patients. So we may skill patients. We could also, you know, with the help of like-minded people, try to provide um, jobs to people with MS. As we do all of this, we also conduct annual medical camps that are completely free of costs. And Sushrusha Hospital in Bombay is of great help to all of us that helps us conduct these camps uh, for the patients. We also do a lot of social programs to uh, bring in some joy and cheer to MSPs and their families. Another area where MS Society spends a lot of effort is on education and guidance. So we do continuous uh, medical seminars for our patients and for the caregivers. And this year, as part of our uh, India MS Day, which is celebrated, I should not say celebrated, which is, uh, uh, which happens to be the first Sunday of uh, February every year. Education, again, is our theme. And today's session is our fourth session of this month that we are doing. 
So the first session happened on 5th February, which was the India MSD. And this program happened in Bandra. And we had two eminent neurologists, Dr. Saroj Kazarak, uh, who is Emeritus Director, Director Neurology, Jaslok Hospital, and Dr. Satish Khadilkar, uh, who is Dean and Head of Department Neurology in Bombay Hospital. And we had these two doctors uh, come and give an understanding of MS, but also it was a great interactive session that, where all the patients and people that were there were benefited. Dr. Katrak talked about the various diagnostic methods, uh, symptoms, and how early diagnosis uh, helps in managing the disease better. Dr. Khadil Khadilkar insisted that it is advisable to start the disease-modifying drugs at an early stage of MS, which helps to control MS attacks and also reduces disability. The second session in the session in this whole month was where we had delegates from MSIF who visited the MS office, and they had with the MSIF delegates and uh, our own MSSI members, and along with other patients, we had various workshops that day. This was followed with our third program, which was again an uh, interactive program with MS Society members. We had uh, five neurologists and the delegates of MSFI who were part of these discussions. So the doctors who participated in this particular session was, again, Dr. Saroj Katrak, uh, Dr. Neeta Mehta, who is former professor in HOD Neurology with uh, Sir JJ Hospital, Dr. Sangeeta Rawat, who is dean of KEM Hospital, Professor Neera Jain of KEM Hospital, and Dr. Sachin Vaidya of Coolridge Hospital. So in all, this, um, this month has been really good in spreading awareness of MS and also understanding what are the new things that are happening uh, in the treatment of MS and managing MS. Coming back to today's session, uh, we are lucky to have a great eminent panel of doctors today. And this is very important because <clears throat> people with MS and people who know about MS, they know that it's a team of doctors that is required to manage MS. And that is what actually gives a normal life to MS patient. And I think today's session is aimed at that. Uh, and we have an eminent panel of doctors who are not only acclaimed in their craft, but also have made great contributions to the field of medicine. So for today's session, we have Dr. Mohit Bhatt, who has agreed to chair the session, and Dr. Rekha Bhatkande, who has agreed to co-chair the session. Dr. Mohit Bhatt is an MBBS, MD, and DM. Uh, he heads the neurology department at Kokila Ben Hospital. He is credited with uh, initiating botulinum toxin injection for various movement disorders in Mumbai in 1991. Since movement disorders dedicated practice in India and established deep brain stimulation surgery for Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. He has done great work on the Parkinson's disease, uh, on Wilson disease as well. Uh, he has more than 100 uh, uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications, multiple book chapters, and multiple invited presentations at national and international conferences. And most important, Dr. Bhatt is my doctor. It's because of, because of him <laughs> that I live a very normal life for over a decade now. So thank you, doctor, for chairing this session. Uh, Dr. Rekha Bhatkande, who is going to co-chair the session. Uh, uh, she is again an MD. Uh, she is a consultant gastroenterologist. Her areas of interest are public health and health advocacy. She has uh, a very important publication to her, her name, currently relevant paper because of COVID. Uh, that actually she had written 20 years ago, but which becomes more relevant today. Uh, which is gastric uh, mucormycosis, that is the fungal infection uh, related to COVID today. She is winner of YB Chavan Pratishthan Award. So with this, I thank Dr. Bhatt, the Kukila Ben Hospital, for uh, hosting this session for us. So Dr. Bhatt and Dr. Rekha, please. 
थैंक यू मैं कॉल ऑन डॉक्टर अनु अग्रवाल शी इज सीनियर न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट एंड शी इज गोइंग टू बी टॉकिंग ऑन न्यू डी इन एम डॉक्टर अनु अग्रवाल हु इज़ अ कंसल्टेंट न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट एंड स्पेशलिस्ट इन कॉग्नेटिव एंड बिहेवियरल न्यूरोलॉजी एट कोकिला बेन हॉस्पिटल डॉक्टर अग्रवाल रनस द अल्जाइमर्स डिजीज एंड मेमोरी क्लिनिक एट द हॉस्पिटल इट्स वन ऑफ इट्स काइंड इन द सिटी आफ्टर ग्रेजुएशन डॉक्टर अग्रवाल ऑप्टेंड हर पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट एम डी डिग्री इन इंटरनल मेडिसिन फ्राम मुंबई Uh, she has won several awards uh, uh, both for her academic research and for her contribution uh, so dr galwal please so what to you yeah, hi thank you for all being here it's a pleasure to uh, be meeting all of you after the pandemic and i do hope it is after and we don't see a, a wave again and uh, sheila is here who has pushed this program through and we are all happy to be participating today so i'm going to start off with uh, so what i'm going to be talking today is disease modifying therapy in ms and as you know this has been a rapidly evolving field and the drugs which i'm going to talk to you about uh 3 uh, months later or 6 months later you may see a updated list of even more effective therapy uh with possibly more uh with lesser side effects so we are very excited that finally we have disease modifying therapy to offer our patients with ms so we are well aware that ms is one of the commonest disease which affects young people around the world for the longest time uh, there was a impression that india has very few patients with ms and probably south asia uh, the environment or the genetics are such that we don't see a lot of patients with ms but that has been uh, changing and we do know that there are fair amount of people affected with ms in india and for us too it is equally as important a neurological disease as in the rest of the world and we know that it's a progressive disease patients may present with a clinically isolated attack but the commonest form of ms is a relapsing remitting ms where a patient gets a attack recovers they gets a attack again and recovers and some of these patients do not recover completely in between attacks and do develop certain disabilities which over time may increase and this is where uh, disease modifying therapies uh, can really help patients in preventing relapses and also preventing disease related disability uh, especially as the time goes by Rem remember we are talking of a disease which affects people in the young adulthood so we have a entire life span uh, to uh, of where we need to look after the patient and see that they remain functionally active and uh, lead normal lives so we know ms is a white matter disease where there is inflammation in the white matter or there are plaques or sclerosis uh, which happens in different parts of the brain and spinal cord and the eye which dr niren will is going to talk to you in a little while but we also increasingly realize that it affects the gray matter so if we were to image brains uh longitudinally we would see that the brain in people who have severe uh, form of ms they show changes even in the gray matter so other than the relapses there is also possibly a low grade inflammation or neurodegeneration happening in the brain which may not be immediately uh, seen on mri but if we give disease modifying therapy we may uh, prevent that or decrease the tempo of its progression so this is what we are looking at to change so we know that as time goes by years and decades there is increasing disability uh, which may be seen in patients not only due to neuroinflammation but also neurodegeneration 
So what is the treatment strategy? So we know that if you have a t acute relapse or acute attack, we need to stop it immediately and the standard therapy is high dose uh, pulse steroid or steroid injections which are given over a period of three to five days. And to prevent relapses and disease progression, we now can offer our patients disease-modifying therapy. And of course, symptomatic therapy, which would be uh, the main feature of uh, this session, and you'll hear how uh, we can improve patients and their family's quality of life. So let me focus on disease-modifying therapy. So if this is the, uh, what happens over time in patients with MS, uh, if you see this is the inflammation which increases in young adulthood, late adulthood, but as time goes by, uh, inflammation d does decrease. So people over 55 usually do not have relapses. And over time, neurodegeneration, and this is not in one particular patient, but if you take an average of a large cohort of patients, you would see uh, that there is neurodegeneration which increases over time. And this then leads to increased disability over time, so over years and decades, on an average in a cohort of patients. So if we were going to give treatment early in the disease course, we would have a better risk-benefit ratio. That means there would be more benefit by the treatment and possibility that even milder treatments or safer treatments would cause improvement. So this would be the ideal case scenario. If we were to offer the same treatment or even escalated treatment later in the disease course, we would expect that uh, the treatment benefit wouldn't be that great. So as we have heard earlier today, offering disease modifying treatment early in the disease course does make a lot of difference in patients' disability. So what are these disease modifying agents? There are three main mechanisms they work as. They are, an, they are anti-inflammatory or prevent inflammation. They're general immunosuppressions. Or now there are monoclonal antibodies which target special steps in the, in the cascade of neuroinflammation which is seen in patients with MS which lead to relapses and plaque. Uh, formation and there are over 20 drugs which are approved by FD and other regulatory agencies all over the world uh, for MS and I'll run you through them. So the, these are some of the drugs and now the concept which we uh, practice as neurologists it is we don't or we shouldn't ideally be telling a patient to take this drug because now that we have a lot of choice, it's possibly going to be a common uh, discussion-based decision-making where we discuss a patient's goals in life, their preferences, and discuss which therapy would work for an individual patient and go ahead with those therapy. Of course, we'll have to keep in mind uh, what's, what's the patient's disease severity and what are the adverse effects that we are affecting. Now, mind you, the first drugs which have been available for 40 years is interferon and glatimer. And this whole thing in blue, light blue, are oral drugs which have really changed uh, the way we view MS. So it's much simpler taking oral drugs rather than taking uh, subcute injection on weekly, bi-weekly basis, or these monoclonal antibodies and other uh, therapies which are uh, given on daycare basis uh, after hospital admission. So the drugs which are written, uh, they are in ascending order of uh, escalation. These are efficacious given in the early category. Then it would make sense to switch to a th uh, drug with a different mode of action within the same level of efficacy. So uh, next question is, can I plan a family? Yes. We are talking of MS in patients who are young and they would be uh, you know, uh, we hope that they uh, pursue their careers and active family life and plan children. For some of the drugs, we have to discuss, the patients needs to discuss with the doctors because some of the drugs do affect uh, reproduction and sometimes we need to wait for a little while uh, before the couple is asked to conceive. Uh, this all as doctors, we would be discussing when we uh, start the therapy, and that is one of the goals we consider uh, when we discuss which uh, DMT a particular patient should uh, preferably opt for. 
and can I take vaccination? So live vaccinations generally are not recommended while a person is on DMT. Uh, other vaccinations like COVID, we do advise patients to take because MS itself and the DMT also increase the risk of uh, infectious diseases. So when do I stop DMT? So if a person is on DMT and responding well, do we take on and on? Um, it's not very clear. Remember DMTs, this range of DMTs have been in the market and real world use only for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, but the general feeling is this, that as we age, we saw in the first uh, graph that I showed you that the the tendency for neuroinflammation decreases. So generally, uh, beyond the age of 50, 55, the risk of neuroinflammation is much less. So maybe in those patients, we can consider uh, re uh, reviewing whether DMT needs to be continued. Uh, but it, and patients who uh, are say above 45, we, we would also uh, you know, reassess with the patient if they've not had relapses, do we give a uh, trial of uh, stopping DMTs and seeing what, it is, what is happening. But mind you, there are a number of prospective studies now looking at this, and we should have some answers uh, soon. But if the drug is working for a patient, uh, the, uh, the MS is under control, uh, this, there are no major adverse effect, DMTs are of more benefit than stopping DMTs. And of course, the treatment of MS doesn't stop with disease modifying treatment. As we know that it affects multiple system across the body. So in the next sessions, we will be talking about, uh, Dr. Bhatt will be talking about fatigue in MS and we'll be talking about neurologic problems, rehab in MS and uh, how the eye and vision are affected by MS and uh, what are their treatment options. So before I end, I would like to thank uh, you all, our patients and caregivers who have taught us as much about MS as any of the published literature and meetings, scientific meetings that we attend. Sheila Chitnis and the MSSI for their constant encouragement and keeping us on our toes. And my two residents, Dr. Ashwini Patankar and Amira Patel, who helped uh, in putting this lecture together. Thank you for your attention. Or DMT. And what do we monitor in the uh, patients on DMT? Is see, look for clinical relapses that would decide whether the DMT is working or not, and if we need to escalate therapy, that it would involve clinical examinations, patient keeping a check on their symptoms, and periodic brain and spinal cord MRIs. Uh, we need to monitor for drug side effects, which would depend on what particular drug we are using. And as a group, as I said, most of these drugs uh, decrease the immune system or modify the immune system. Uh, we have to be aware that they can predispose to infections. And as you know, the immune system is also involved in uh, malignancy surveillance. So we have to keep a lookout for malignancy. Of course, getting malignancies or developing malignancies with use of DMT is very rare, but we need to keep a check on that. And how do I switch from one DMT to another? That's not recommended. If one DMT is working on a particular person, we stay with that DMT. If the disease activity does increase, then we escalate therapy. So even in the first uh, column, you see there are lots of drugs with different mechanisms. So we don't switch between different drugs based on their uh, uh, mode of action, we switch on the degree of efficacy or escalation. So we move uh, to a higher escalating uh, therapy. The second thing which we need to monitor is the adverse effects. Uh, if a person does develop adverse effect to a particular drug, say in this category, then it would make sense to switch to a uh, drug with a different mode of action within the same level of efficacy. So uh, next question is, can I plan a family? Yes, we are talking of MS in patients who are young and they would be, uh, you, you know, uh, we hope that they uh, pursue their careers and active family life and plan children. For some of the drugs, we have to discuss, the patients needs to discuss with their doctors because some of the drugs do affect 
uh, reproduction and sometimes you need to wait for a little while uh, before the couple is asked to conceive. Uh, this all as doctors we would be discussing when we uh, start the therapy and that is one of the goals we consider uh, when we discuss which uh, DMT a particular patient should uh, preferably opt for. And can I take vaccination? So live vaccination generally are not recommended while a person is on DMT. Uh, other vaccinations like COVID, we do advise patients to take because MS itself and the DMT also increase the risk of uh, infectious diseases. So when do I stop DMT? So if a person is on DMT and responding well, do we take on and on? Um, it's not very clear. Remember DMTs, this range of DMTs have been in the market and real world use only for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, but the general feeling is this, that as we age, you saw in the first uh, graph that I showed you, that the, the tendency for neuroinflammation decreases. So generally, uh, beyond the age of 50, 55, the risk of neuroinflammation is much less. So maybe in those patients we can consider uh, re uh, reviewing whether DMT need to be continued. Uh, but it, and patients who uh, are say above 45, we would also uh, you know reassess with the patient if they have not had relapses. Do we give a uh, trial of uh, stopping DMTs and seeing what it is what is happening? But mind you, there are a number of prospective studies now looking at this, and we should have some answers uh, soon. But if the drug is working for a patient, uh, the, the MS is under control, uh, this, there are no major adverse effects, DMTs are of more benefit than stopping DMTs. And of course, the treatment of MS doesn't stop with disease modifying treatment. As we know, that it affects multiple systems across the body. So in the next sessions, we will be talking about uh, Dr. Bhatt will be talking about fatigue in MS and we will be talking about urologic problems, rehab in MS and uh, how the eye and vision are affected by MS and uh, what are their treatment options. So before I end, I would like to thank uh, you all, our patients and caregivers who have taught us as much about MS as any of the published literature and meetings, scientific meetings that we attend. Sheila Chitnis and the MSSI for their constant encouragement and keeping us on our toes. And my two residents, Dr. Ashwini Patankar and Amira Patel, who helped uh, while putting this lecture together. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, our next speaker for the day is Dr. Nareen Dongri. Uh, he is going to be talking about optic neuritis in MS. Uh, Dr. Dobre is, is a retinal surgeon into practice treating diseases of the retina uh, since the last 20 years. He specializes in retinal detachments, diabetic retinopathy, macular hole and epiretinal membranes, macular degeneration both age related and hereditary, retinal and uh, uh, vitreous hemorrhages retinopathy of uh, prematurity. So we are really lucky to have Dr. Dongle. He has also co-authored various journals and books on ophthalmology. He also has delivered presentations on retinal conditions at various national and international ophthalmic conferences. Dr. Dongle. Good evening, everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Bhatt for inviting me today. And i also like to thank him for trusting me with all his patients, all his referrals that he keeps sending me throughout the last 14 years that I have been associated here with Coquilabin Hospital. From day one, I've been seeing most of his uh, neurology uh, references which come to me. So I thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for that. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Sheila Chitnis. She's been calling me almost uh, every day and sending me WhatsApp messages confirming my presence here. So thank you, Dr. Chitnis, for calling me here. So <clears throat> I'll just uh, begin my talk. So is acute loss of vision, is it multiple sclerosis? That is what uh, I'm talking about. And uh, most of us must be aware that eyes and window 
so people say that eyes are a window to the soul i mean whether that is really true or no but certainly eyes and window to many health conditions so uh, throughout the day i almost receive four to five uh, uh, reference calls either it could be a icu it could be the neonatal icu it could be um, just an opd patient it could be a ward patient so they want me to look into the retina and uh, that helps the physician the neurologist the cardiovascular surgeon the ca cardiologist the neonatologist so basically if we look into uh, somebody's eye so eye is an extension actually eye is an extension of the brain so th it's a very unique place where we can actually see the nerves you can study the vessels the blood vessels so a lot can be told by uh, looking at a person's retina so in fact sometimes an eye doctor will be the first physician uh, to diagnose a medical condition before the first signs may appear so as the standee here says one of the first symptoms is blurred vision and um, uh, double vision so eye is an in a window to your health and being a retinal specialist so i am privileged to actually look at the retina and um, and help most of not only the patient but the, my colleague doctors in um, in in kind of di not only diagnosing but kind of correlating it's a correlation that takes us because there's no one particular test which tells that okay this is ms so it's a correlation of multiple things that that helps my colleagues so retina is very unique where we can actually see the blood vessels we can study the blood vessels so looking at the blood vessels we we know what's happening with the cardiovascular health of the patient looking at the nerves we could say what's happening with the neurology part of the patient so <clears throat> in fact when an eye doctor observes the retina and the optic nerve during an examination he or she is actually looking at the extension of the brain now to to get to get a uh, to get to know what's happening in the brain we need to do an mri but if we just quickly look at the retina and do i'm going to talk about it a simple test like an oct we know a lot what is happening at the level of the brain without having the patient to go through the mri mri i know any patient here would say mri is is all the patients dread going into that mri machine so these are quick tests which can be done when we are trying to kind of um, once the diagnosis is established and we want to keep on following up the patients these simple tests like oct looking at the retina is what is going to help and an easy way to look at look at the patient so the initial presentation of ms 33% of patients with ms present first to an ophthalmologist with eye complaints either it is a blur vision it's a sudden drop in vision a blur vision or foggy vision so 33% patients will first come to an eye doctor and typically when a patient sees nothing that means patient's vision has dropped and the ophthalmologist ophthalmologist sees nothing that means when we look in now typically a general ophthalmologist might miss out because he might say absolutely normal i i don't see anything wrong inside the eye he may look all the way up to the optic nerve and say there's nothing happening inside your eye but the patient says i'm i'm seeing blur so when the patient sees nothing and ophthalmology sees nothing think of optic neuritis because retrobulb optic neuritis will not show up in fundus uh, fundus examination it will be an inflammation which is not behind but when patient sees nothing and ophthalmology sees nothing think of optic neuritis and ms <coughs> so affected individuals how how do they get affected they, they get affected in two ways either their vision is blur or their vision is double so there are two pathways one is an afferent pathway and one is an efferent pathway very simple the whole circuit when the when the image goes from from the eye to the brain that's afferent and then when the brain reacts to that stimulus and then moves the eyes that's called as the efferent pathway and both these pathways can get affected in ms and that's where how the patients will come so if it's the afferent pathway which is affected patient might come with decreased vision and if it's the efferent pathway the number 2 symptom the double vision so double vision is when the efferent pathway is affected <clears throat> so quickly this is a diagram where you see this this is the op optic nerve the yellow one here this is optic nerve so this is a afferent pathway so if this is inflamed that's the afferent pathway being affected and the vision becomes blur and then efferent pathway that is from the brain now to the to the extraocular muscles so if one of the extraocular muscles are affected then the patient will obviously get double vision or internuclear ophthalmoplegia i won't go into the details or nystagmus just shaky eyes so that's when the efferent pathway is affected optic neuritis can be the first demyelinating event in 30 patient 30% patients of ms and subsequently if patients do have ms then 40% of them during the course of ms are likely to develop optic neuritis just a quick uh, look into suppose a patient comes in so i've just uh, for an example i've shown a 30, 31 year old female visits 
IOPD with complaints of seeing a black spot in front of the of the eye and on movements of the eyes the patient has pain or a decreased vision so what do we do next when such a patient walks into our OPD so I'll take you through that <coughs> so how do you diagnose so diagnosing is very simple first is a Snellens chart that we have the, most of you all must have gone to an ophthalmologist it's just a chart on which we read at a particular distance then a very important test is a color vision test. Now this simply is many of the patients even walk in saying that they have desaturation of red color. That is typical, you know, the, of optic neuritis. The first color to be uh, desaturated is the red. So most of the patients come and say that lal rang fika dikh raha hai. So that, that is one of the common symptoms. So we check for the color vision. We check for pupillary reactions, a very simple test with a torch light, which is done in the OPD. We see for the relative afferent pupillary effect. And then obviously comes the next step. So most of these things are done by our optometrist. And then the patient comes to the consultant where we do, where we put dilate the pupils, then check the retina of the patient with an indirect ophthalmoscope or a fundoscope. And if we feel that, yes, now there's something we are looking at, uh, the optic now, then we could do the next step that is called as a visual field test or a perimetry. And uh, we could record by taking a fundus photograph and OCT I'll just subsequently talk. We could also refer them back to the neurology department where visually evoked potential like a VEP is done to establish a diagnosis. So there's no one particular test. All the tests together, then we can say that, okay, that this could be MS <coughs> related optic neuritis. So these are the basic tests um, just in a, in a photographic uh, representation. And uh, on fundoscopy, when we see the, the retina, as I said, when the doctor sees nothing, that means on your left hand side, this first picture here, an optic nerve is now absolutely a normal looking optic nerve. So this, but still the patient may have blurry vision. So this is retrobulbar neuritis. That means optic nerve is perfectly normal looking to the doctor, but behind the, the optic nerve is swollen. So that is called as a retrobulbar. That means behind the, behind the eye, the intracranial part of the optic nerve is, is inflamed. Or it could be a swollen optic nerve. Now this is easier to diagnose because the ophthalmologist can see the papilledema, the swollen optic nerve, and then refer the patient to further tests. Or it could be both the optic nerve as well as the adjoining retina being inflamed. That's called as neuroretinitis. So it could present in different ways. <coughs> a big long differential diagnosis of optic neuritis. This is essential because as I said, there's no one particular test to diagnose MS. So we have to um, kind of eliminate other diseases, then, then we come to the diagnosis. I won't go into the details of the DD. So, uh, what are the tests? So, we do a simple test, complete blood count, serum B12 level. So, is it related to vitamin deficiency? Is it tuberculosis? So, do a tuberculosis testing. Is it syphilis? Do a VDRL. Do an HIV. Do an angiotensin converting exam to rule out sarcoidosis. Um, so these are the tests that we keep doing and then come to a final conclusion that pro probably this is an optic neuritis related to uh, do a CSF uh, analysis where a lumbar puncture or fluid is taken from, uh, from the back uh, from the spinal cord and then uh, test that for IgG antibodies or ol oligoclonal bands. So one by one slowly as we get all the information from these different tests then do a VEP. So VEP is not confirmatory. It doesn't confirm that one has uh, uh, MS, but still it can, it can uh, when it's in dispute and when the VEP is delayed, then it can tell us that yes, there is a, probably a demyelinating uh, optic neuritis that we are looking at. And then obviously uh, MRI, which Dr. Anu has already talked about. So here in the MRI, you can see the optic nerve on this side, it's swollen. You can clearly see this uh, by the arrow, which is shown here. And then the, uh, on the right side, the image shows the plaques. Now the interesting thing going ahead is an optical coherence tomography. This is a very simple tool um, which is available in, in, in the OPD of most, most of the ophthalmologists now have this called as uh, optical coherence tomography where we can actually see the thinning of the retina. And as I said, it's a very simple test which can be done in an in outpatient basis without the patient having to go into higher tests like MRI. And when we can look, because retina is an extension of the brain, so looking at the retinal thinning, we can make a prognosis as to how this patient uh, disability chart which Dr. Anu showed, the disability and time. So as the time uh, goes on, the disability worsens. So we can repeatedly keep on doing these OCT scans to see whether there's any correlation between the retinal thinning and the disability the patient has. So OCT is a good tool going ahead <clears throat> and uh, we can track it easily. 
and it's non-invasive. <coughs> so this is an OCT picture. This, this is from our OPD at Coquilevin Hospital, and you can see uh, the optometrist doing an OCT scan. It's, this, it's as simple as this. The patient keeps a chin here, and then uh, the scan takes just two or three minutes to complete for both the eyes. And you can see the pictures here. Now, this is a normal retinal uh, uh, OCT. And there are 10 layers of retina can be seen. And the one below, you can see definitely there's thinning there as compared to the... So this thinning can be picked up and charted out. And then we know how, how the retina is thinning in uh, post-optic neuritis. So OCT is an interesting tool. And now we have OCT and geography. So that's one step ahead. Without pushing a dye intravenously, non-invasively, we can do an optical coherence tomography and geography. So that that's also has a role in, uh, in, in MS and in tracking the optic neuritis patients. So management of optic neuritis, as everybody knows, when a patient comes with an acute optic neuritis, the best drug till date has been uh, methylprednisolone, which is given intravenously. It's given one gram daily for three days. And sometimes in uh, certain cases, we can go beyond three days to even five days. So it's one gram a day for five days. Oral steroids should not be given as a first line of management. Do not use oral steroids as first line of management. It has always got to be the IV methylprednisolone because otherwise the relapse rate and uh, the duration of the disease can prolong. So avoid prednisolone orally until after treatment with IV. So once the intravenous uh, course is over of three or five days, then we switch the patient on for 14 days of oral steroids in tapering doses. So steroids obviously is the gold standard and still remains the gold standard. Rarely, very, very rarely, patient may need a plasma exchange. I won't talk much in details about that. And prognosis. So most of the patients with optic neuritis do very well. Most of them re they recover their vision uh, very well, regardless whether the patient receives a high-dose corticosteroid, but the recovery is good. And uh, the five-year recurrence rate was found to be higher in oral prednisolone. So again, the take-home message is do not give oral steroids as the first line of management. It should always be IV methylprednisolone. Uh, there was one study which uh, like correlates optic neuritis with multiple sclerosis. So the 10-year risk of a clinically definite multiple sclerosis was 39%. That means somebody who has had an optic neuritis after 10 years is 39% will get in, go, go into MS. While at the end of 20 years, almost 50% will get into MS. So optic neuritis is an uh, important precursor to, uh, to MS. And this, this risk is higher in women three times. So in addition, MS was more likely uh, to develop, and one, one more thing, most important is when uh, retrobulbar neuritis is classical, that the picture which I showed you before, I'll just take you back to that picture, where here, uh, this retrobulbar neuritis where optic nerve head to the ophthalmologist looks absolutely normal, These, this is a classic uh, neuritis which the patient is likely to go into MS. So this is a this is an important precursor to a patient possibly rather than an op, uh, rather than a papillitis or a neuroretinitis. The new retrobulbar neuritis is more important uh, predictor of a uh, of a patient going into multiple sclerosis. So with that, I end my uh, my talk. And obviously, uh, this is a combined team effort where ophthalmologists, neurologists, neurophysiologists, where we send for VEPs, and obviously a radiologist. It's a teamwork to to tackle uh, MS and optic neuritis. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dungre. We have uh, Dr. Anita Patel as our next speaker. She is a consultant urologist in Mumbai. Uh, she has completed her urological uh, qualifications from KM Hospital and she is FRCS urology from UK. She is the only lady urologist in India with FRCS urological, uh, urology qualifications. Uh, her special interests lie in lower urinary tract dysfunction, including prostate disease in men, incontinence, and other forms of voiding dysfunction in men, women, and children, both diagnosis and management, semi-rigid and flexible urethroscopy and RIRS. 
Currently, Dr. Anita works as consultant urologist with endoscopic clinic uh, in Mumbai and Global Hospital Parel again in Mumbai. So, welcome, Dr. Anita. Over to you. Thank you so much. Namaste, everybody. At the outset, I wish to thank uh, Sheila Tai. Um, I've been associated with MS for a very long time now. So for me, it's like family. Geeta, she's somewhere in the audience. So they are like first name basis. So thank you so much for calling me here. Um, I know the audience is largely the patients and caregivers. So is it okay if I speak in English or do I speak in Hindi? What would the audience prefer? Mix of both, it doesn't matter. Since it's a little scientific, English obviously would be preferred by us. But just feel free to, you know, interrupt in case uh, you want me to switch the language. So we all know that the disease is characterized by patchy loss of cover on the nerves, both in the central nervous system as well as in the spinal cord. And there is a slightly higher preponderance in women. Now this is relevant to a urologist because in general there is a higher preponderance of urinary leakage or incontinence in women. So if a disease is largely affecting women, it's very likely that a larger number will come to us with leakage if they are already suffering from MS. So what's the normal urinary tract like? This is for all of you. So. Uh, do we have a pointer? Okay, so the one at the bottom is the urinary bladder. It's a smiling bladder. Khush hai bladder. And there are two kidneys. Most of us are born with two kidneys. And the kidneys are happy if the head of the urinary system is happy. So the head here is at the bottom. It's very interesting. Neurology and urology have just one alphabet which is different. One is here and one is here. That's very interesting, isn't it? And still, this is one disease which behaves, or rather misbehaves, because this doesn't behave properly. So MS attacks the head of the urinary tract, which is the bottom. So if head of the urinary tract is unhappy, then obviously the kidneys and the rest of the system is going to be unhappy. And there are inherent differences in men and women which is why certain diseases are typically seen in men and certain in women, even urinary tract-wise. And in MS, of course, more so because the leakage issues, issues, as I already mentioned, are more common in women. So what does urinary bladder do? We are all sitting here and assuming many of us have a normal urinary tract, we are not dripping urine. The reason for that is there is a circuit, exactly like how there is a circuit in various systems in the body. The urinary bladder sends a signal to the brain, then brain processes the signal to decide, is this the right time? Am I in the toilet? Have I removed my clothes? Have I shut the door? Can I start passing urine? If that circuit is not complete, the brain just does not allow the bladder to start. What happens in MS? All the circuits somewhere get interrupted, so either the information is late to reach the brain, or even if it has reached the brain, the signal from the brain is late to reach the bladder. So the patient may perceive ki haji mujhe pishap karna hai, but the patient is not able to control because the bladder is not listening. The bladder is behaving like an independent party. That becomes an issue in MS. So the basic function is we need to be able to hold the urine. We need to be able to empty the urine. A minority of multiple sclerosis patients have struggled with emptying of their bladder. And we will talk about that later. But the commoner issue is inability to control urine. So let's not go into the detail, but the nerves and the spinal cord, as well as the brain, I've excluded that from this diagram, they have a way of controlling the urinary bladder function. And there are two ways. One which happens automatically. We don't even think when we want to go and pass urine, it's like you press a button and the light comes. We don't know that what a circuit goes on. Same thing happens with the bladder. We go, we sit on the commode or whatever, we start passing urine. We are not thinking that abhi signal bheja hai, abhi brain ne permission diya hai, abhi mein shuru kar raha hu. No, it happens very quickly. But in MS that can get interrupted.
so the automatic circuit can get interrupted and in some patients the ability to voluntarily hold the urine can also get interrupted now why is that interrupted many ms patients will struggle to walk and if the bladder gives signal so quickly whereby you must go now otherwise you will leak how can a patient who's struggling to walk how can he reach the washroom so many people have issues with leakage not because their bladder is fault as the only trouble but because they are not able to run to the washroom they may be in a wheelchair the commode may not be handy it may not be comfortable for the patient the bottle may not be handy so on and so forth so we can modulate these at multiple levels and we know that age is catching up with all of us isn't it all of us are aging at the same rate if i turn say 60 tomorrow somebody else is going to turn 60 at the same rate age leads to a lot of changes in the body more so if you already have a disability so what happens in urinary tract the commonest symptom is going to pass urine frequently so storage symptom that means patients are not able to hold peshab rokne mein mushkil hai the relatively less common symptom is inability to empty that means urine pura karne mein mushkil ho rahi hai why does it happen as i already mentioned bladder sends a signal the processing may not happen so the brain and bladder are not really talking to each other very nicely what complicates the matter is there may be associated bowel issue so ms patients it's not just urinary tract they will struggle with their bowel some of them might land up having soilage of their clothes because they can't hold their motion motion doesn't bother the patient so much because it's solid and it takes a lot of effort for motion to leak urine is liquid it needs a tiny hole so ms patients are really embarrassed because what happens if urine leaks there is smell there is wetness there is embarrassment and you are all the time looking for the loo or you may be wearing a diaper but diaper may get heavy may get so um, you know soaked and there can be sores as a result of diaper being wet and constantly being in touch with the skin so there is a lot of collateral damage which is associated with urine related issues so what happens there is a higher chance of infection obviously if the area around the urine is going to be soaked all the time that means there is no dryness there bacteria like a damp environment so anything which is wet bacteria will catch why there is a higher possibility of stone formation because if a bladder is not emptying or if there are repeated infections both of these can contribute to development of stone however as ms very rarely leads to death ms very rarely leads to a serious urinary issue it leads to a lot of bothersome urinary issue leakage hai i can't empty i need to catheterize there is no privacy public toilet so on and so forth will i die because of urine related issues of ms very unlikely will i develop kidney failure because i have ms and i have urinary issues almost never so the only good thing is that it's very rarely a cause of a serious urological disease so it is mainly a quality of life that we are talking about social quality of life personal life problems during intimacy um uh, anuji already spoke about can ms patients have children but can they have sex forget the act of reproducing and actually getting pregnant but there are issues because they may be embarrassed because of urinary leakage so this is where counseling and a good neurophysician urologist maybe a sex therapist can be handy that your urinary leakage in any way doesn't prevent you from getting pregnant so there can be a lot of intimacy related issues and of course financial damage i don't have to tell you people what's the cost of a diaper and how many diapers do you need in a day it's not easy to be having urinary leakage it it really drains your purse so these are all collateral issues so the first thing is talk about it you know we i mean you go to a park and there are people who will say that no i had a bypass and now i have a coronary stent i have never heard somebody saying mai diaper pehen raha hu mujhe na leakage hai nahi baat karte hain because it's embarrassing you know we walk with a stick which is okay 20 people are walking with a stick but if you go to say shivaji park or some park in juhu area would you know how many people are walking with a urine bag you don't know we don't talk about urinary tract and that is what makes it difficult 
So we must talk about it first to your family members, then to your employers. If you're in employment, you need to use the washroom frequently, or maybe you need a separate facility, a wider entrance, or maybe privacy to catheterize. Talk about it to your employer. Talk to your colleagues so that, you know, we feel they may be mocking at us. They're not. They're going to give you empathy, definitely. And finally, talk to the doctors. Because if you don't talk about your urinary issue, how will the doctor be able to treat it? So what do we do when I, as a urologist, see a patient with MS? So of course, I'll examine, I'll talk to you, I'll find out, is leakage the main issue, or are you struggling to empty, or uh, is it urinary tract infection, or maybe do you have pain, do you have bleeding? That might lead me to the fact that you may be having a stone formation, so on and so forth. So the standard test that a urologist will do will be a simple urine test. We will always do a sonography. We will ask the patients to maintain a bladder record. A bladder record means like how you write a diary, you write a record of your bladder. In a day, how many times and how much? How much can be tricky for MS patients? Because, you know, by the time they reach the washroom, get a container, pass it in that half the urine may have leaked. But at least they can write down how many times am I going. So I need to know, is this gentleman going every 10 minutes? Or maybe is he going every two hours? I must have some figure with which I can gauge how bothered, how bothersome are his symptoms? How much are they interfering in his day-to-day -day life? So bladder diary is an invaluable tool. And then in selected patients, we do fancier tests. The image on top is a sonography. See, MS doesn't mean you don't get other diseases. You can get prostate disorder. You can get uh, gynecological disorders. You can get UTI due to other causes. So a sonography will tell us a lot about that. And this test, which is what we most commonly do, which is called as a flow metric, which tells us the flow pattern. We make the patient pass urine on a special commode with a sensor at the bottom, and that tells us how the person is passing urine, and we can infer a lot of things based on the flow metric graph. Very rarely we need a detailed evaluation called urodynamics, about which we don't really need to go into details. What can I do to treat such patients? The first thing is, change in lifestyle. Somebody asked me outside, how much liquid do we need to drink? Uh, so we are not a plant which needs to be watered. Okay, we must drink enough as per our thirst. So if my body is telling me I'm thirsty, I should drink water. I shouldn't drink because somebody says that drink one liter in the morning. If you're suffering from MS, you will spend whole morning in the washroom. So listen to your body. And about one to one and a half liters for somebody who's indoors and sedentary life, is good enough. Anything more than that, let the doctors advise. For example, people with infections, people with calculi, uh, people with stone, we tell them to drink more water. How do you train your bladder? So in MS, before the bladder catches you, you catch the bladder. So you devise a program whereby you pass urine, say, every one and a half hours. So that before the bladder makes it so difficult for you that you have to run, you tell the bladder, I am the boss, I need to reach, and I will make sure I go every one and a half hours. Or if you are going out, then make sure you curtail or you reduce your drinking liquid for about, say, one to one and a half hour before that. And at home, maybe you can make use of specialized toilets, commodes, etc. Overall, increase the activity level if it is possible, because if you are active, it will help your bowels. If your bowels are empty, that will help your bladder. You know, it's a lot of organs which keep uh, sort of a watch on each other's behavior. Pelvic muscle training, we will talk about it in detail if there is a question later on. Somebody was asking me outside, but Kegel exercises, they're not only for women, men and women both will benefit by it. There are drugs about which Dr. Anuji mentioned, bladder relaxants, and we have really come a long way in usage of bladder drugs. They are highly selective bladder drugs. They have negligible side effect profile, and those drugs really work wonders. Can they be taken long term? Yes. Is there a side effect? Now we know that even up to five, six years, these drugs are safe. The commonly used drug is solifenacin. And a newer drug is Merabegron. And both these are very safe drugs. Oxybutynin may have some issues like um, constipation and dryness of mouth and some skin rashes, etc. But the solifenacin as well as Merabegron are brilliant. Diapers, 
there are excellent quality diapers available there are pull ups available they cost but if you use a good diaper then it at least ensures there is no skin reaction no wetness etc there are diapers which can be pulled down quickly you need a protective garment on your bed in case diaper is an issue those are available on amazon at a very low cost in the washroom you need a non slip mat next to your bed you need a non slip mat imagine you want to pass urine you're not wearing a diaper you've leaked urine and you slip in the puddle of your own urine and fracture your femur so forget ms forget urinary tract now you're in the hospital because of fracture neck femur so non slip mat urologically very important barrier creams are available because agar aap diaper pehnte ho to it can get wet so let there be a layer of barrier cream available so that the skin sores or ulcers etc don't happen antibiotics we don't really need unless there is active urinary infection with fever otherwise very often patients abuse antibiotics by taking them rampantly no please ask your care giving doctor unless there is uti with symptoms or a significant number of pus cells avoid taking antibiotics so in a nutshell all of these apply to every ms patient if you follow all of these that means develop good habits learn the bladder control timed urination bladder relaxation doing various modification in your day to day habit if you do that i think that is all that you really need for patients we just spoke about the diapers these are the catheters which are used for self catheterization very easily available available in the remotest village in our country the tube at the bottom is a feeding tube it's not a urinary catheter and this is an infant feeding tube available across the country and the cost of that is very low this is the tube that i use for self catheterization when we teach that to my patients what is the cost of one tube so if you bought a box of 100 each tube will cost you 7 rupees if you bought a single tube it will cost you 57 rupees so there is a huge difference between the cost so always check with your doctor they will tell you a patli galli how to reach the dawa bazar there is everything is available same thing for the diapers do you need to wear gloves to self catheterize no clean hands washed hands can i use the same tube again and again actually yes if you follow clean technique same tube can be used again and again you know when we brush teeth in the morning we brush teeth we wash the brush we keep it there next day we pick up the brush we use the same brush in our own mouth and we are not sterilizing that brush okay so if you wash your catheter with clean water and use clean technique every time you can use the same catheter a few times ideal would be to use a new catheter because the urine tends to harbor bacteria very easily but you can use the same catheter again and again and uh, there are lubricating gels available some catheters are pre lubricated so they are also very handy but otherwise lubricating gel the two top tubes one is an antiseptic solution and one is a gel it's available either in a tube or in a bottle whichever that is handy so uh, with this i'm going to stop uh, whatever that i had to say and then if there are any questions uh, we would welcome them in the end thank you so much shilata thank you chairperson for uh, allowing me to say a few words thank you thank you dr anita uh, the next speaker is dr darshpreet kaur she is an mpt neuro neurology and psychosomatic disorders and an fnr she is chief physiotherapist bihar neuropatna Uh, she has done a great lot of work in the field of ms uh, she is a global finalist in ms brain health individual awards for hcps in may, may 2022 okay. she uh, she pioneered a, a a six weeks online rehab program for ms patients in 2021 and then she also developed a 10 week motor imagery program for ms patients in 2022 uh, she is uh, she has uh, delivered over 100 talks and workshops nationally and internationally she is an acclaimed person in her own way so welcome dr darshpreet and over to you thank you so much for the nice introduction and at the onset i really want to thank each one of you for having me here mumbai has a bit of my heart 
and uh, this year I finished my 15 years with MSSI. So you can all imagine the uh, persuasiveness or the bonding which Sheila ma'am has with every person she meets. Uh, so uh, with that, um, okay, capturing the untapped imagination power. Trust me, this is not a new topic. Right now if I say suddenly a Santa Claus walks in and he starts giving us gifts, there is a confetti that are falling on us, maybe some rose petals and all. How does that feel suddenly? It's a pleasant surprise. The world of imagination is something, if you imagine good things, you actually start feeling too good about yourself. And the world of negative imagination is such, hone se pehle hi we start predicting ki mere saath aisa na ho jaye, waisa na ho jaye. Okay, so let's see how we can tap this imagination power in a positive way. Please, apne andar ke bacche ko jaga do. I guess we worry too much. It is natural to a great extent. It is necessary, but sometimes it's not required. All right? So more than me, I know each one of you knows MS much, much, much better because you are the one who are the first line warriors. We are assisting you with the arsenals, with the guns, with the bombs and everything that you can think of to fight this battle. But in the forefront, you are the real warriors. So the most important thing is, apne andar ke bacche ko jagao. And while I say that, because every child has a very different vision, and with that they attach a lot of emotions and their senses into it. So the day we learn being that, trust me, we win this battle. If I'm sitting here, my one mind goes to my daughters. Ah, what would have been a beautiful Saturday evening, a swim with them, or maybe playing Lego with them, or maybe in a park recording my Pilates videos for my MS warriors. Imagination can take you anywhere and all three things, they have a lot of vision, they have a lot of emotion for me attached. All three of them give me equal amount of happiness. So in 2021, when we were all hit by MS, we started with a new project, See and learn the exercise. In that, we were supposed to perform a set of exercises. I guess few of you were a part of that online program. And in 2022, we launched another program, see and learn the exercise, and this time just imagine the exercise. Because in the 2021, we had to leave a lot of patients because our inclusion criteria was they were able to perform six minutes walk test. So that actually made us feel a little bad because we had to exclude a lot of patients. See, whenever we talk about research, we cannot go emotional about it. There are a lot of checkpoints under which any research is being carried out to come out with something more conclusively. And 2023, when I'm physically here, there cannot be a moment that Sheila ma'am will leave me without giving another surprise for you all. So that slide will come later in my talk. So what basically what I'm trying to instill in all of you is the power of daydreaming. The brain uses the memories to help power our imagination. If you can't imagine things, you just cannot learn. And that is how we teach our children. Kitab ke samne mat betho. It's better so jau. And aajkal with so much of fantastic videos which are there, Dr. Mbai Knox and all that, children can actually imagine things. With Coco Melon and all, we can see wo kya thi kavita, rain, rain, go away. We always used to imagine that boy come again another day, little Johnny. Now my children have the privilege to see the Johnny, he's dancing in the rain and imagining that world. So definitely they have better cognitive processing than what we have because their world of imagination is much more widened. So what is motor imagery? It is a cognitive process in which the subject imagines that he or she performs a movement without actually performing the movement or without even tensing the muscles. Uh, actually, interchangeably, we use a lot of terms for motor imagery like mental practice, mental imagery, mental rehearsals, though there is a little difference between them. But for today's lecture, let's keep them as synonyms. All brothers and sisters, where we act Activate the same areas of brain that are activated when physical movement is actually carried out and it strengthens the signal between the brain and target muscles. 
so if we see the various areas where motor imagery has been used that is being used in clinical psychology even in human space flights when the, when our uh, spacecrafts they land back to india the uh, people are made to imagine the effect of microgravity before they land back in the gravity area then with elite athletes with surgeons also they also mentally rehearse the kind of surgery they have to perform mentally okay i'll do this that 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 that's a kind of revision we say but that's actually motor imagery or mental imagery to rehabilitate the motor deficits in stress management for students for musicians and a lot i'm sure you want to agree that easily with what i'm saying i need to put forth certain evidence because you are all are very smart fully equipped with google baba so let me get you some facts from google baba okay so basically there was one study way back in 1996 so what i'm talking today is not something new but definitely now we are pushing more towards its utilization in our normal practice it's the activation in the motor cortex during motor imagery amounts about 30% of the level observed during actual performance so we can see two brains where the actual moment was performed and when there was a mental rehearsal that was being performed so you can see almost the same amount of activation in the brain so i guess you are a little bit convinced that motor imagery has some power okay one more evidence for you so this is another study where they showed there is increased connectivity underlying structural organization of anatomical structures and functional brain networks are being strengthened so that is motor execution the first graph that we see next is kinetic motor imagery then is visual motor imagery and third is simple visual organization in short you have to do something So what I'm talking about today is I'm not giving you an option. Gone are those days. As a medical fraternity, we have been really working very, very hard about these things. But somewhere where the effects fizzle out is in the execution. So you have to do this, and you will start this the moment you are out of here. Okay? I know Mumbai traffic is killing. So why you are going? Just keep imagining good things by the time you reach home. Okay? So kindness. kinesthetic motor imagery and visual imi uh, motor imagery are the two things that we are going to more focus about and what's the difference we'll just see that shortly so this question would you like to have a stronger imagination yes unanimously yes you don't have a choice trust me after 15 years being in ms now i don't give you a choice as your rehabilitation specialist okay So the trick is to experience more things in life. You have to come out of your well and you have to start experiencing more things and now the things have become much easier to experience. Now we have got those VR goggles. Just put your mobile into it. There are simple YouTube 3D videos which are available. So keep seeing that and you can see yourself walking along any distance doing any kind of activity. Things have really become very affordable. and that will help your brain to store more memories and to draw from when you imagine so usually what i say to my patients please take out your old photographs take out your marriage pictures take out your childhood pictures whatever memory that you have that is going to strengthen your imagination power ki aap kaise uthke baithte the aap kaise chalte the aap kaise khate the but make sure you're going to see that positively i don't want to see ki apne purani album dekhi aur hum ek ghanta rote rahe uske baad gone we are not here for any kind of sympathetic thing we are warriors and we are going to fight this and we have already been fighting against it okay so two types of motor imagery that i told you one was just visual and second was kinesthetic uh, the terms themselves explain the kind of work is which is being done visual is ability to imagining seeing oneself performing the movement okay so for example i have this video simple a simple vision video a simple uh, exercise performance and you are imagining ki hum aisa kar sakte hain ek ball lenge us pe ghutna lagayenge and done as simple as that jo hum tv serials dekh ke we get so inspired ki hum bhi aise taiyar ho sakte hain that badi bindi and ekta kapoor style we do get very easily influenced okay 
when i talk about kinesthetic that is similar to the real movement that is ability to imagine performing a movement by having an impression of the muscle contraction please understand the difference when i talk about kinesthetic i am not going to physically move any of my muscle i am going to start imagining the sub components of that movement ki jaise maine ball ko press kiya tha what exactly uh, things were involved to perform that movement let me make it a little simpler to understand now see that simple exercise what we saw how your foot needs to be placed how your knee needs to be placed what will be the position of the rear foot how are you going to press it further and how are you going to back the entire thing you have to imagine ki mera ye paau aise rakha hua hai ball ke niche main aise press kar raha hu aise piche aa raha hu that is your kinesthetic but you are not going to tense any of your muscles in this this is just imagery am i clear with both of these and now i'm changing the sides and now i'm performing this exercise okay feel the muscles which are involved and their action and the feeling has to be mentally now again I know I'm not going to convince you without evidence. So I had better platform than Google Baba. That was our PubMed indexing, and I got the systematic reviews. So these are not the evidence of single studies. Systematic reviews are when a researcher feels like कि जितना भी आज तक का published data है, let me collect it together and see what level of evidence do I have for particular thing. So I found these studies, and motor imagery actually has been shown to be very efficacious in multiple. multiple sclerosis convinced okay so the advantages many studies have shown that neural plasticity and brain activation during motor imagery are similar to the actual physical performance there is no limitation to patient's ability to execute motions so please do not think ki mere pairo mein spasticity hai aur i am wheelchair bound main ye nahi kar sakta that old saying can never say impossible and all you don't have to even speak that or think on those lines okay gone are those times 2023 only positivity okay and effects of motor imagery training are influenced by the environmental context and the patient's emotional condition so make sure unhi logo se baat karo jo positivity dal rahe hain make your environment as beautiful as you can and i think mssi is already doing a great job round the clock everybody is available for a counseling session just to make your aura around you, each one of you very beautiful and clean okay so when we talk about motor imagery we have certain principles that you follow if any one of you has attended our 2022 braining together sessions so you will realize any exercise that we imagine we just divide them into certain parts the physical thing the environment thing the task itself the timing in which you have to perform the task what exactly things you need to learn the muscles and the activation the emotional and the perspective all so basically it's a petlep principle which we do it for each and every movement to understand it better so that we can imagine it better okay now let's address the elephant in the room how to successfully imply this proven therapy at the initial stage i said that what i'm going to say today is not something i have made up it is already there in the scientific literature most of you might be already acquainted with it but there's always a gap there's always a gap wo cheeze waisi nahi ho pati hai what we always intend to and what could be the biggest reason and to one of uh, few of the msps with whom uh, i was interacting during the tea session i told them meri last ki slides aap log bahut dhyan se sunna because probably that's going to clear a lot of doubts because we don't address the failure ye mere liye kaam nahi kar raha hai neurologist ki dawai se kuch nahi hota hai wo thoda hi slow karta hai thoda slow thoda slow 10 thoda slow means 10 dushman already maar bhagaye hain Are you understanding? So there is a hell lot of imbalance. 
15 years with MS and over 20 years practicing as a physical therapist. What I realized and what we have actually started this year, in our OPD, we have a card for patients. What is your expectation and what is your responsibility? Trust me, the expectation list is so big. I got the least waiting time. When I come, sir, I get a little bit of a fight. Test less, write the drugs. The drugs are less and less and less and less and less and less. Don't repeat the drugs. And I mean, one doctor can address everything. Sir, can you see the eyes? Sir, can you see the rehab? Sir, can you see the drugs? Can you see the drugs? Can you see the euro? Can you see the cognitive? Just one place will be everything. Isn't that a beautiful world we all dream about? And when it comes to responsibility, हाँ हम दस डॉक्टर को और दिखा चुके हैं and I belong to Bihar so for Bihar the Makkah Medina is first to Delhi if you are better off to Nimhans Bangalore if you are better off to CMC Villor उधर मत्था टेके बिना पेशेंट नहीं सेटिस्फाइड होता है अरे वो भी यही लिखे सर they come back after six months sir sir जो दवाई आप लोग लिखे वही वहाँ CMC वालों ने रेफर कर दिया Nimhans वालों ने रेफर कर दिया the first thing in your responsibility is please trust your doctor. We have a lot of trust issues. Koi family trust issues ke saath nahi chal sakti hai. The scientific aspect to one side, we have all been working together tirelessly. If you all know during COVID, I was just on my WhatsApp throughout and throughout for my patients. Even when I was COVID positive with my three years daughter. हम सबके प्रॉब्लम्स एड्रेस कर रहे थे, but a simple question क्या आप एक्सरसाइज किए? और नहीं मैडम टाइम नहीं मिला, बहुत बिजी थे घर पे गेस्ट आ गया, अभी वीकेंड है, अभी दिवाली सफाई, अभी दशहरा सफाई, दिस सफाई, दैट गुड़ी पार्टवाई एंड ऑल दैट। Excuse me, expectation list इतना बड़ा and where is your responsibility list? To all my warriors, I'm telling you, जिस दिन ज़्यादा responsible बन गए ना आप, ये जंग तो वैसे ही जीत गए। we are there for you. We, we were there for you. We are and we will always be. Please trust your doctor. And as a physical therapist, let me tell you, if you expect that we will bring wonders in your life without the main doctors, we are a part of the dream. Aloo ki sabzi bina aap yaas tamatar ke nahi banegi. Doctor, touch me. I'm doing a touch. Yes, I'm done. I'm done. I hope this message has gone deeply into all of you because we cannot meet very often, but definitely whenever we meet, it has to be right at the center. All right? So please shift this. Please shift this. All right? So again, braining together, we did this program last year and we have some good results coming up. And we had a lot of warrior meetings online. And uh, yes, in 2023, it will be exploring wonders of motor imagery. This year, I'm not going to give you therapy. The therapy is already there on my YouTube channel. I'm going to just give you the pravachan about it. Become more responsible and get the expectations down. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next session is uh, changing rehab needs of the MS person. And for this session, we have Dr. Abhishek Srivastava with us. Uh, he's an MBBS, MD, DNB, and PhD. Uh, he heads the, he is the Neuro Rehabilitation Specialist and Director for Center of Rehabilitation at Coquilabend Hospital. Uh, he has uh, two books to his credit, 10 book chapters, 60 research papers and 300 invited lectures in neurosciences and rehabilitation. He is winner of multiple awards and we are glad to have you here, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, Shilatai and the MSI team for kind invite. And uh, as you all know, multiple sclerosis has different subtypes and people behave differently with time because of the inflammation and radiation happening simultaneously. Always remember, people with MS live longer like other people and up to about 15 years after diagnosis, 50% of the patients need walking aids and 20% need a wheelchair. So mobility is one cause of concern in long term. It's something called as EDSS score where we can identify how mobility goes down so MS scores in life 
can be in these four stages. Initial stage, time of diagnosis, there is no disability at that time. Early stage, BDSS 2 to 4, when there is some degree of disability started happening. Later stage, 5 to 7 EDSS, people can't go to work, they are bed bound, need a lot of intensive inpatient rehab. Advanced stage 8, 9, when they are practically in bed and need a lot of respite care. The needs will be different in different stages of persons with MS as they progress to the disease process. Initial stage, diagnosis just being established, people are not aware of the disease, they say, what, what has happened to me? So are the persons ready with the diagnosis? No. The key information at the time is to give them information regarding the disease, the disease process, the medical management, and start counseling very, very early. Early stage, people have some relapses, some disability start happening, people are afraid, will I become disabled for life or not? So coping with MS is a very important part at this time. We should allow provisions for support and informed advice for psychological problems, relationship, employment training, financial planning. Provide them access to medical management, integrated rehab, and start teaching them about supportive interventions like nutritional concept and exercise training in that early stage of the disease. Later stage, people have disability coming up, which some of them are permanent, some of them are fluctuating. The whole goal of treatment is to maximize functional independence, minimize the disability. That will require a lot of inpatient rehab or an outpatient rehab delivered by a multidisciplinary team. And along with that, provide continued education, employment opportunities, and transportation and vocational rehab. Advanced stage, people with severe disabilities, they can't do take care of themselves, practically in bed, both for mobility as well as self-care. People are mainly staying at home or nearby nursing home. They need a lot of animal control unit, respite care, and continuity of service care. These four stages are the basic people MS pass through. So any MS service should have components which can address all these issues in those four stages of life, which should include services providing diagnosis, services providing education, shared decision making, relapse management, medical therapy, symptomatic management, disease modifying drugs, counseling, vocational rehab, health promotion, concomitant disease management, they have diabetes also, hypertension also, they have multiple issues to manage them, and long-term palliative care. So an MS service should be able to provide all these things, then you can say you can treat MS in a more, much more comprehensive way. There are multiple issues, so it's a team which is required to manage these patients, which can work together in a gel form to help our patients. Now, if you go back again, initial and early stage, first one to four EDSS, People have a feeling of crisis, shock, despair, what has happened to me? At that time, the key person is the primary neurologist. Because he is the one person with the people trust, who has to counsel the disease process. And if you have a nurse coordinator or a specialist person who can just sit with them, give them more information, that is what is required. Always remember, the way people will respond in long term depends upon what information they get at this time in their disease process. So education is the key in the initial stage. Also in the initial stage, people have some, some relapses, one or two, in the beginning. What will bother them at that time is fatigue and weakness. But we'll talk about fatigue afterwards, but simple pacing techniques, adaptation, aids, appliances, some exercise will help for fatigue. Also, what to educate? There are four components specifically for MS. One is personal concerns, one is medical information, one is adjustment skills, and life planning. These four components should be integral part of a MS-specific education program to help person with MS. Weakness, people will say, I get tired. One is fatigue, and second is, both are one is practically weakness. We thought in the beginning, MS can't do exercise because heat will cause worsening of symptoms, but no, you can do a submaximum exercise test, give them a home program, they can go to gym, do some exercise, keep environment cooler, they're very important, but they have to do aerobic conditioning training right from the early stage of the disease. Fatigue, Dr. Baj will speak about that. Also, simple tips of stress management. So, fatigue management, 
some exercise, aerobic exercise, simple tips of stress management, organize your life, take a break, communicate with that, and practice relaxation techniques, simple tips in the beginning can help to reduce fatigue and weakness in long term. Later stage, people have relapses and they have some form of disability. These patients will require either an inpatient or outpatient multidisciplinary rehab program. These patients will require transportation to the workplace. We normally forget. They can't drive a car or they can't drive a scooter now. They need a modified scooter or they have somebody to drop to the workplace. Any long-term programs for all these 19 problems, cognitive issues, spasticity, bladder dysfunction, gait disturbances, ataxia, vision, speech, swallow, sexual problems, emotional disturbances. So the hospital at this time big, is a bridge between the community and the family. So they have multiple problems. They have to come to a place where they get solution for all these nine, ten things in a much more comprehensive way. So you can minimize disability. And that will require an inpatient or outpatient type of rehab program. We call this 666 concept. Patient needs physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, solo therapy, cognitive retraining, counseling, all in this stage to maximize their functional independence. Mobility, they will need training. We all know physical therapy is integral part of mobility training. This technology helps, yes, for some patients who are only having lower limb weakness, depending on the robotic system, can help improve the mobility. Will it last long? I don't know. But if you are not able to walk, a training on physical therapy conventional with robotic assistance can be able to maintain mobility for the next few years if the disease process is stable. It can help. Technology helps now. People have memory problems, they have uh, behavioral problems, they can't interact with other people. We need a full assessment called a neuropsych assessment. But do a basic cognitive screening tool can be done. So we can know what they are lacking. They lack in attention, concentration, thinking, memory, planning to find out. And then a good cognitive rehab along with that to either remediate the deficits or learn compensatory strategies to bypass these cognitive deficits. We always forget about the invisible disabilities in MS. We think about motor deficits. People with MS along with motor have cognition, speech, swallow, bladder, pain. Talk about it. Activity daily living, they can't perform because some disability is there. And very common thing which we miss is follow. People have both cervical spine as well as the brain dysfunction and they have difficulty, in, they choke, and they have saliva keeps on rolling. So we might do a full assessment of follow uh, with a very solo study, what is wrong, pick it up. And now again, technology is coming up. This is called as vital stem. Uh, it's a MD approved device to improve the energy muscles improve your speech and solo dysfunction. It helps a lot people who have specific deficits. Ataxia is very bothersome. People have incoordination and nothing works. No medication works for ataxia. Always remember, primarily physical therapy and compensatory strategies will help. Pain. We don't talk about pain. Pain is because of, you know, sensory deficits. Tense helps that. UTI causes pain. Flexor spasm causes pain. Medication causes pain. What is the ideal treatment? good psychological counseling and if it is treat the cause if it is neuropathic type of pain give medications if it is muscular type of pain give tens and medications if it is past treat, treat the muscle relaxant with that in the western world cannabis is approved now for pain in ms in india it's not approved till now i hope it doesn't get approved in india also <laughs> many of our patients buy dsc oil from us and they come and use it in india which is happening now in india also Spasticity, we all know. Always remember, don't reduce spasticity in the walking person with MS. If he's already walking, if you give them antispastic drug, their will, knees will buckle. But some patients, like person like him, who cannot bend his knees because of when he's walking, we give him botulinum toxin, a Botox shot, and gets him muscles and rectus from his muscles, his knees. As you can see, they can bend his knee, his stick is gone. So antispastic medications and botulinum toxin can help select group patients to, to maintain or improve their mobility. You get better, Dr. Patel already spoke about that. We forget the bowel. People can have primarily constipation, sometime incontinence. A simple bowel program, wake up in the morning, have liquid, a hot liquid, sit in the commode, 30 minutes before that, in the night, take some laxative or some fiber supplement diet, 
and if you can't pass with that take your breakfast you get the cholesterol reflex go and pass motion a simple bowel program can help to evacuate people don't need suppositories and enemas if they follow the simple like the bowel program sexual dysfunction very common you can see in women the main issue is hypogasmia or loss of libido in men it can be erectile dysfunction the primary approach is sexual counseling medical management is only for erectile dysfunction the rest all need primarily positioning catheter care or sexual satisfaction advanced stage people are becoming totally dependent they need to be nursed in home nursing home or a nearby place some patients who have more than two type of disability interfering at this time so they getting contractures very big spasticity they need medical management with medications some need intrathecal backflow and pump some need botulinum toxin braces because if you don't do that if there are fixed contractures they will have secondary problems of positioning pressure ulcers more utis hygiene issues that will improve the cost of care and need more hospitalizations so good spasticity management this time very very important to prevent secondary complications and giving good respite and palliative care all the other quality of life very very important both for the person and the caregiver the strain comes from the caregiver they also need time actually in western world there is a concept of shared care so when people come to your house to your house to help your daily course in india the concept is not there but mmsi i hope is doing this work and they sending people to at home to give proper care when the person can go to go out and work always remember this term in ms this is a new term for quackery called charlatanism because of the variable nature of ms and lack of cure people have tried everything possible snake venom bee pollen to cure their disease as person treating ms a physician the job is to listen to the patient dissipate tell them this this is wrong this is a myth counsel them and tell them evidence based treatment which is possible to do try all different type of things or the member educate them so to summarize nidoria abnms is a disease of progressive adults most patients live normal life span but they have chronic symptoms with diminished functional status rehabilitation and optimization functional status is the integral part of medical management of ms multiple rehab programs are very important A regular rehab evaluation is recommended as the disease process worsens to pick up what is wrong and treat them as a team thank you very much thank you dr abhishek I would like to invite Dr. Mohit Bhatt for his session on fatigue in MS. I think everybody is tired by now. So I will make it brief. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, Yeah. And uh, I have been not been associated with the MS society regularly but quite irregularly uh Sheila Chitnis calls me up once in a while whenever I see her name flashing on the phone I get very stressed <laughs> because I know that she is now going to ask me to do something and and I know that I will not be able to escape so it's best to answer those calls and then try and escape but it's impossible so to just sort of accept it and uh, and i'm happy to accept it because we have had very long association i meet people with ms with different problems and i always learn from these meetings and listening to other my colleagues is also a great pleasure it sort of revises my knowledge i started neurology in the 80s when there was no ct scan so we probably missed a lot of ms and by the time i became a neurologist mri scans had just come so those were the first scans when ms was being seen and those were early scans so probably we were still missing ms and those were the days when my neurology teacher dr wardia dr singhal with whom i trained would talk not talk of ms very often because we all were under the impression that ms is rare in india 
I don't know whether it is rare in India or we were missing because we were not having the advanced scanners which came much later in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, <clears throat> But my feeling is that MS has also increased. We were with similar clinical symptoms and signs, we were seeing less patients. I don't know whether it is changing of habits, westernization, what, whatever you may call it, we are seeing much more MS and MS-related problems. And today, you can see that all, most of the drugs which Anu showed over here, which are used in MS, are now available in India. So the pharma company also thinks that these drugs ought to be marketed in India because there's a demand and there's a need. So MS has definitely increased. And as you can see from my other colleagues who spoke who have erudite and understand the disease well. So MS has become common enough for doctors and neurologists to learn about it, read about it, and progress in understanding and treating patients. So I'm going to do something very, very So MS is an uh, inflammation of the brain <clears throat> and fatigue is a common symptom in MS. A lot of patients will come by exhaustion, fatigue. It's important to remember that fatigue and depression are separate things. So you can have disability and fatigue, you may have depression and fatigue, and you may just have fatigue and no depression and no disability. So fatigue as a symptom is common in MS. 75% of patients complain of it. And it's a very subjective thing. So you can't, it's very difficult to define it. When you see a patient, he says fatigue. There's no test I can ask the patient to go ahead and do it. So it's a sense of exhaustion. It's a sense of not being the same. Doesn't have the physical vigor, the mental energy is missing. And when patients complain these things, of sometimes the doctors do not pay attention to them. And they push it, okay, one more symptom. But sometimes it is important to listen to the patient because fatigue is something when a patient says, Doctor, I don't have the energy. You must not neglect the symptom because this is treatable. This needs recognition and this needs certain looking into. <clears throat> so there are many reasons for fatigue. We will not get into the reasons. But some of the common reasons which are related basically with the brain disease. And the brain disease reasons, the doctors are treating them with drugs, so we leave them apart. But then there are other reasons why patients do their fatigue increase is the sleep disorders. Patients are not sleeping well. They have something called restless leg syndrome, where at night when you go to bed, you, you feel creepy, crawly feeling in the legs. You need to walk. You need somebody to massage your legs. So restless leg syndrome. Lack of sleep for a long period of time. And and your circadian rhythm disrupts. Patients are not sleeping enough at night. They sleep in the daytime. So all these things are related to the primary disease in the brain, but they have a secondary impact as manifestations. And so there are lots of, if the patient, so the patient is coming to you, it's very difficult when it comes with low energy. How do you assess? So first you have to get into the sleep. Is the patient sleeping well? Is the patient's quality of sleep okay? Is the patient getting, uh, is he having restless leg syndrome at night? So sometimes we do subject these patients to sleep studies. Or you also investigate them for depression. Is the patient depressed? Then they require treatment for depression. <coughs> then we do a whole lot of tests. We do iron studies because if you have low iron in the body, you are going to get restless leg syndrome, low vitamin B12, thyroid abnormalities, D3 levels are low. It's important that in MS, patients with should have adequate D3 levels because low D3 makes you more prone to get more, more disease. So checking their D3, looking at their B12, thyroid, these are all tests that we do when we have a patient with uh, fatigue. So fatigue, you have to go, whether it is sleep problem, whether it is depression, whether it is mood fluctuations, which requires treatment and if all that is treated and if still the patient is saying, no, I am not okay, I am still exhausted, then we are really dealing with fatigue related to MS. <clears throat> How do we treat it? Ask the patient to exercise. Dr. Abhishek Srivastava has mentioned, and my previous speakers also mentioned about the importance of exercise. So get back to exercise, whatever exercise you can do. Have a trainer, start self-exercising, 
through uh, now there is so much information available on the internet use best time of the day so patient has to keep whenever they have to do a useful thing they have to do it when they think they are best is it the morning is it the afternoon so that patient has to select do not make your day very busy you know do not take on responsibility there are some people who have ms and they are and then they are also still very highly functional individuals and then they take on responsibility and then the responsibility adds to mental tension mental tension adds to lack of sleep lack of sleep adds to fatigue so it's important that you plan how much work you will take on avoid alcohol and hot environment you mentioned that cool environment is always very useful for patients with ms <clears throat> what are the drugs we use the commonest drug that we use today are two drugs amantadine and modafinil amantadine i'm sure we prescribe to a lot of patients who are fatigue it's a very useful drug the moment patient complain i sometimes feel very gratified when a patient comes to me and he complaining of fatigue and patient has seen multiple doctors and that fatigue symptom has somewhere been neglected and I, i see the prescription doesn't contain amantadine i know i am going to give that magic pill to the patient and patient going to come back saying that ah doctor i'm feeling much better so if you feel happy when somebody misses giving amantadine and i can do it because i know that's going to give gratification to the patient and i know he is going to be a happy patient modafinil is another drug that we use to prevent daytime sleepiness patients are awake during the daytime so they can sleep at night so these are the two drugs that we use for fatigue so that's in sh- very short how do i deal with fatigue so fatigue as i said is a subjective symptom it is something patients complain it is outside depression it is outside sleep disorder it is outside restless leg syndrome it is a separate symptom by itself which needs a discussion with the patient so as i say ms is not a one way street it's a two way street the patient tells you you tell them what you are going to do to them so you together decide what treatment you are going to give to patients it's a it's a joint effort and sometimes listening to patient listening to them and it's so often fatigue is missed because pe- doctors listen to it and they move on to more is a urinary problem that's a very important thing you need to t- attend that if the patient is having balance problem you need to attend that in this process sometimes fatigue is missed so fatigue is an important symptom i think i made a very short presentation on fatigue because my other colleagues have done a fantastic job thank you so much thank you dr bhat Uh, I'm going to request Dr. Rekha, Dean of Sushrusha uh, Hospital, to summarize the sessions before we get into question and answers. Sir, if you will come and join. Thank you, Kranti. Uh, first of all, I really like to thank our speakers today. They were wonderful, you know. and i'm just going to give you what i am taking from their uh you know all their uh, what they have been telling us and what are the take home messages um dr anu what she really told us is um treat early in the disease i mean that's the key message she gave us I and mean, if we can do that then your uh, then all your um, uh, you know you can catch the disease early treat the disease early then your relapses and your subsequent disabilities are probably also addressed early then of course she did tell us that if there's no evidence of clinical activity then you can you need to uh, you know modify your for the therapy uh dr nirain he actually did tell us that the retinal scan is a very very useful uh tool you know the oct and in fact they i recently read a paper where they said that maybe you could actually uh perhaps if if enough tests uh, enough uh, <coughs> research is done where you could actually uh, pinpoint the relapse in an ms by just actually looking at the retina you know the so let's hope that can happen because it's a very very quick and easy method 
may not be very, um, um, it may be expensive, but I think it's an extremely good method if somebody was to actually find out that relapse could actually be uh, you know, diagnosed in time. Uh, what Dr. Niren also said is, uh, you know, do not, your steroid therapy has to be intravenous. You cannot initiate steroid therapy taking oral drugs. You cannot do that. And that's very important. And that is why, in fact, MSSI patients are, uh, are welcome to Shushusha because we treat them free uh, and uh, because of the MSSI connection. And, uh, and they, they come in for steroid boluses, you know, the three-day, five-day treatment. Uh, Dr. Anita, as usual, uh, did a great job telling us that urology and urological problems are uh, probably a part and parcel of MS, so uh, we really, really should be looking at it. And she always has this smiling bladder and then, you know, the upside down smiley bladder, you know, so I mean, that really does tell you. What I did like what, what, was what she said, you know, that when you pee in your clothes, you need to communicate with your friends, your family, your colleagues, and your employer. I mean, if you can do that, then your quality of life uh, is going to be much better. Dr. Dashpreet, great. So now you are telling us that an impact on all, probably all musculoskeletal disorders, neurological degenerative neurological disorders may be impacted with motor imagery. I mean, that's, I, I think that's great. Because we are actually, the whole virtual reality, uh, you know, platform and the space, if that can be therapeutic, in, in chronic diseases, I think that's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Dashpreet, for that. Dr. Abhishek, of course, has always been the motility man, and he has um, uh, told us how it can be done in the initial and early stages of MS, in the later stages of MS, and of course, in advanced stages of MS. And uh, he says he is, uh, the key to all this is information. And if you have the information, then team, com uh, team concept of management and, uh, you know, all the invisible symptoms and all that MS, ultimately people are finding speech, uh, swallowing, all these, you know, there's such beautiful therapies now for that. So I think, uh, thank you, Abhishek, that was wonderful because that really gives a better quality of life and that is what he had actually uh, stressed on and shared care. I think that is a wonderful thing because today home care is something that we are really, really promoting but shared, shared care, I think that is something that is really very good. And of course, no snake oil therapy, charlatism. <laughs> okay. And of course, Dr. Mohit, I mean, he's my chairman, so I leave it to him to sum up what he has said. <laughs> but what I have gathered from what he said is, you know, he, he started off asking us a question. In the past, was MS really rare in India or was it rarely diagnosed? Because you know, we didn't have a CT, we didn't have MRI, and how that has really made it uh, possible to diagnose MS. And, and we are really, MSSI is going all out to find the actual incidence of MS in our country. And uh, what he says makes a lot of sense. And of course, then the secondary causes for uh, fatigue, because fatigue is such a, such an important thing. So, just one question. Uh, does keeping um, wet packs in the fridge and then using them on, on your limbs, 
you know, after coming back uh, from whatever, you know, daily activities, does that help in fatigue? I really don't know. But you, what I, when I talk to patients, you know, patients have a lot of ways of alleviating symptoms. Some people put wet packs, some people want to sit in an air-conditioned atmosphere, some people put wet cloth, you've seen them on their heads. So, I mean, if it helps a patient, it helps. And I would not take it away from a patient. Absolutely. And of course, your uh, advice about energy conservation, I think that was marvelous. Please, all of you, remember that. Nobody wants to be fatigued. And you need to understand what are you spending your energy on. And you need to uh, time manage the energy spent. So thank you very much, sir. Yeah. In the audience? We have a few questions. Maybe the yeah. <clears throat> I've got five questions from the audience. I've got five questions, six questions with me. First is, uh, there's someone in the audience who has written, my girl is 22 years old now. When she was eight and came hospital after all the diagnostics, she was diagnosed with MS. For the last seven to eight years, uh, she has not had any attack, but she still gets epilepsy. So she doesn't, is, does she have MS or she does not have MS? And what do we understand from this? Yeah, uh, so she was diagnosed with MS based on? Uh, she's 22 years old and uh, with various diagnostics actually. The doctors of KM hospital told her MS after doing all the tests. Okay. So uh, epilepsy is a condition where peop uh, a person gets seizures again and again. Uh, and epilepsy or seizures is a symptom of MS. It's a rare symptom, but it can be seen in patients with MS. Uh, so that doesn't detract us from the diagnosis. But if you are concerned, maybe uh, just going back and seeing your doctor and going over all the tests which were done earlier, you can just uh, be reassured that the diagnosis was in fact correct. But epilepsy is a symptom, like ataxia, or imbalance, or vision problem is a symptom of MS. The thing is that the has no other yeah, so, uh, so I mean, they can relook at the uh, diagnosis and see whether uh, it was MS or there are you know, now other conditions which look like MS, whether she has one of those. They did a bu bunch of tests, I think, and that's how they done. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe yeah. just re-look at the diagnosis. Yeah, so whoever uh, raised this, please, uh, you can offline talk to, connect with the doctor and understand what could be the next steps, please. Yeah, the next question is, why do MS patients get vertigo? I'm an RRMS patient, uh, body not balanced while moving, motion is uncontrollable, uh, SPMS treatment is expected when? And I had uh, Tecfidera after uh, healing. So the question is primarily why do MS patients get vertigo? So the main reason for vertigo is that MS plaques in the brain stem are sometimes close to the mechanism or the ear mechanism which can produce vertigo. So vertigo is a common symptom of MS. Sometimes we see vertigo as a presenting feature. A young girl coming with chakkar vertigo and very little neurology on examination, we have to think of MS. Because vertigo is an uncommon, but in MS you can see vertigo because of the involvement of the plaque. And it's not very difficult to treat. We give drugs, we give vertigo exercise, and patients do improve. Yeah, so the next question is, uh, I get frequent burps uh, belching all day long after receiving uh, steroids, uh, about five doses, and uh, injection, uh, I don't know what this is, four doses. Rituximab, yeah. four doses. And what to do for frequent belching? So, 
again, steroids, often you must have seen when patients are given steroids, we give anti-acid tre treatment because steroids can produce, irritate the stomach and you can get burping, you can get GI. So that's why we always insist that the steroids have to, here it is intravenous steroid, but if you have to get an oral steroid, we insist that it has to be taken after breakfast or after lunch. It should never be taken on an empty stomach, <coughs> mainly to uh, treat, so that you do not get GI irritation with steroids. And it's easy to treat. Occasionally, we ha if the GI symptoms are very severe, that we have to withdraw the drug. But in most cases, we do give antacids and motility drugs which control the motility of the stomach and you do not get regurgitation and you do not get GI symptoms. So not difficult to treat. Often the doctors will give you assist, drugs to assist and not have these symptoms. The next is the rituximab, yeah. four doses. Yes. So rituximab. So what to do with the frequent belching? Again, I don't know what to do with belching. Belching is a very, uh, is a sometimes you must have seen, it's very, it's again very, belching is a symptom seen in certain regions of India. If you go to Gujarat, so some, lot of women will belch and this, they come to you with belching and you say, why do you, and, ooh, they can belch. So a lot of people can belch voluntarily and it is not a disease. <laughs> so, it's very commonly seen in certain regions of, of India. So belching is a, so I don't think belching is a disease by itself. So it needs to be seen in, and something with a rituximab somebody wants to know. So rituximab is a drug that we use as a disease modifying agent. We don't use it very often, but it is one of the drugs that we, off, we need to use in very severe MS where you cannot con uh, control the disease with conventional drugs. So we occasionally use rituximab, but we do not, because there are now so many effective drugs available, and these are oral drugs. So a rituximab is an injectable drug. So we do not go to rituximab very easily, because it changes your immune system, and you are prone to infection. So it is only used when the routine conventional drugs are not very effective. Yeah. Uh, the next one is, uh, is there any scope or chance of remyelination? And then there are multiple questions there, but that's the first one. Okay. Before we come to the remyelination, I think in one of the questions it was mentioned, uh, somebody had asked about secondary progressive MS. So I didn't touch on it, but so briefly, the commonest variety of MS is relapsing remitting, where you get a relapse, recover, get a relapse, recover. But in some patients, they develop what is called as a secondary progressive, which means that with each relapse, the patient recovers, but not entirely. So they're left with a little deficit, and that little deficit accumulates with each relapse. So over time, they may have a significant deficit. That is called secondary progressive MS. So the good news is there is a drug which has been shown to be effective for it. It's go it is marketed uh, uh, as of last year in North America and Europe. Uh, it is not yet available in India, but we should probably have uh, pharma uh, uh, get it to our shores soon. So, and there are lots of drugs under study for secondary progressive MS. That is, if a person already has secondary progressive MS, but the uh, if you have MS which is recently diagnosed, uh, the current line of thinking and treatment approaches start the DMT early so that we don't reach a stage uh, where we accumulate disabilities over time. So I would encourage uh, you to encourage your fellow patients to really uh, consider DMTs because those can be really life changing. Now the remyelination question, so MS is a demyelinating disease. So demyelination, D means is Latin for absence. So what happens is there's inflammation in a part of the central nervous system, which is the brain or the spinal cord or the eye, where the insulation of the nerves or the nervous circuit is lost, which is called demyelination. And that is called as a plaque. So if you were going to see a plaque under microscope, you would see a lot of inflammatory cells and the myelin being destroyed. But then with natural healing, which can be hastened by giving IV steroids, what we're trying to do is stop the inflammation so that more myelin and the nerve cells are not destroyed. 
and then as a process of body's healing myelin is regenerated so there is remyelination but in a case scenario where a person keeps getting attacks again and again you may reach a stage where the myelination is not complete and they are left with residual deficit and that's what leads to secondary progressive uh, ms so again we come to dmts uh, the quick use of steroids as soon as the attack starts if you quick consult your doctor and take the methyl uh, prednisolone dose don't sting on uh, taking three doses instead of five don't bargain that and say that I want oral rather than injection you want to hit hard to stop the inflammatory attack or plaque so that the remyelination is quick and complete and you want to re really consider DMT so that you don't or the person doesn't develop attacks again and again yeah thanks what is uh, the difference in approach of normal physiotherapy and neurophysiotherapy and when does a patient consult a neurophysiotherapist why don't both of you have a quick response to this so the difference between neuro and the regular physiotherapy? Yeah, normal physiotherapy and neurophysiotherapy. And when should a patient consult neurophysiotherapist? Okay, so it's just a terminological difference. All physiotherapists are almost alike. But yes, due to our predilection towards neurology, we tend to do masters. And now I'm doing my PhD in electrophysiology and its relevance to rehabilitation. So probably after a couple of years, this question will come, how can a rehabilitation person start doing electrophysiology? So it basically depends on your interest area. Both are same. All you have to gauge is whether they are able to understand your problem pretty well or no. Getting me? All... Uh, like MBBS doctors are good, but then they go for their specialization and further specialization. It's, it's you who has to choose which one to go about it. But yes, definitely neurophysiotherapist does make a difference because day and night we just think about neurological issues, the brain and the spinal cord and associated things. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so then the next one is uh, what's the efficacy of uh, stem cell therapy for MS? There is no stem cell therapy for MS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so don't get into this bogus stem cell propaganda. You will be, somebody will steal your money and there will be no improvement. So please don't get into it. And for some. And for some. So, so there is another thing. There is a, there is a, there is a section of neurologists who do bone marrow transplant for MS. So bone marrow transplant is a viable treatment in some centers, where, but careful large studies are still awaited. But the stem cell therapy that you hear in the city, please avoid. Avoid, run away from it. <laughs> yeah. What's the impact of excess iron accumulation in the brain? So... Uh, there are particular, so iron is a metal, the brain handles a lot of metal. There are particular set of diseases in which excess iron uh, gets deposited in the brain and it causes whole lot of number of diseases. Dr. Bhatt and I have been involved in studying these extremely rare uh, disorders. Um, in MS or in Alzheimer's, in Parkinson's also, uh, there is there are studies which show that the iron metabolism may be not normal and if you were to image them you would see excess iron deposition in the brain but remember iron deposition is seen in any scar in the body so if you would take a scar and do special imaging and see it under a microscope you would see iron calcium fibrosis and a collagen and other things so but in uh, reference to ms uh, it is not a iron deposition disorder and iron chelation does not help in MS. Unlike in patients who have this, what we call as iron, uh, neuro, uh, neurodegeneration due to iron disorder, NBI, where iron chelation may be of some benefit. So that's more of a uh, neuropathological interest, but has no therapeutic or diagnostic implications in patients with MS. Yeah. Uh, how to know my RRMS is shifting towards SPMS? 
So this the patient tells us. We don't need a doctor for that. So if you if a person has MS, wherever if whether it's ataxia or vision problem or limb weakness or paraparesis, they come. MS is diagnosed, we give steroids, the patient recovers within hours or days or weeks, and they're completely back to their normal life. But when the patient tells us that, look, I have not yet recovered completely, and I have this residual limb, I have this residual visual problem, you know that you are, uh, the person is accumulating uh, disability, and we would be very watchful for this patient, and again, open the question of starting uh, DMTs in this patient. Second is that suppose a patient has relapsing remitting MS and they come for a routine follow-up. They may have not noticed a limp or they may not have noticed a vision problem, but as neurologists and treating doctors, they may not have noticed bladder problems, but that is our concern. We would proactively ask them this question, do a physical examination, and as far as the eye is concerned, what Dr. Niren said, OCT, we would want to do a OCT to see that even though the patient is not complaining of vision problem, is the retinal layer uh, thinning out, we would definitely ask them for uh, bladder complaints. And even if your doctor is too busy and has missed asking that, please do volunteer uh, those complaints. The reason is, one, is that we can treat the symptoms. And there are strategies to do that. Some of them you heard today with physiotherapy, drugs, and other man medical management. And the second is we want to, if the patient is not on DMT, we want to start DMT. Or if the patient is already on DMT, we want to consider whether this is due to frequent relapses or secondary progression. And do we need to escalate to a different uh, DMT? Yeah, uh, I've got uh, two more two more questions. Uh, CoQ10 is it useful in MS and the role of antioxidants in MS? There is. We do not prescribe CoQ10 routinely in practice for patients of MS because there is no solid scientific proof that these drugs work. Yeah, okay. And the next one was, Dr., uh, role of antioxidants. Similarly, antioxidants, there are lots of drugs available in the market as uh, antioxidants f beneficial for patients with MS. We, in our practice, do not use these drugs. Okay. Uh, the next one is, my eyes are seeing everything in my eyes. Can it be okay? No, sorry, can you repeat that thing? Sorry. My eyes are seeing everything in my eyes. Can it be okay? Yeah, so, seeing everything in my eyes means that basically the movement, eye movements is synchronized. We have two eyes, but we see one. So, I think you should visit an ophthalmologist and see whether the ocular balance, or the eyes balance, if it's because of MS, डिस्टर्ब हो गया है तो यस देन हिलता दिख सकता है बट इसके दूसरे कारण भी हो सकते हैं नॉट नेसेसरी लेट दैट दिस इज एमएस रिलेटेड इट कुड बी सम अदर आई डिसी सो फर्स्ट पहले तो आपका आंख डिटेल चेक कर लेना चाहिए कि ये एमएस रिलेटेड ऑक्यूलर बैलेंस से रिलेटेड है या मैक्यूलर डिजेनरेशन मेनी पीपल हैव मैक्यूलर डिजेनरेशन जिसमें यानी पीछे पर्दे का जो सेंटर पोर्शन है मैक्यूला उसमें अगर कोई बीमारी है तो हल हिलती हुई दिखेगी चीज़ें सो एक डिटेल्ड आंखों का चेक करना जरूरी है बट यस एम एस में हिलता हुआ दिखता हो सकता है सो दैट इज पॉसिबिलिटी थैंक यू डॉक्टर द लास्ट क्वेश्चन हेयर इज वॉट इज नो पोस्ट कॉन्ट्रास्ट एनहेंसमेंट एम एम कैन एंड इज इट सेकेंडरी एम एस वॉट इज नो पोस्ट कॉन्ट्रास्ट एनहेंसमेंट एम कैन and is it secondary MS? Yeah, he has had that question. On the MRI, if it says no post-contrast enhancement, what does it mean? Two MRIs are not okay. So that's a very interesting question. So see, on MRI, supposing a patient comes, and we are talking about relaxing repeating MS. So the patient will say, see, five years ago, I had a vision problem in the right eye, got better. Then two years later, I had, weakness of both limbs got better. 
now I uh, today uh, for over a few hours I have developed a high weakness. So in our mind we are thinking, oh, this is relaxing remitting MS. So, but the patient has given us a timeline of symptoms, and they have told us the different parts of the central nervous system are affected. Because the first time it was the eye, the second time it was probably the spinal cord because the legs were weak. Now it's the hands or probably the brain. So the patient is telling us, look, I have a disease which is spread in time, which comes and goes, and also spread throughout the nervous system in different areas. Now, I'm, so that is by definition MS. Uh, MS is a neurological disease which comes and goes, which is relapsing remitting, and it is spread over time and in space. Space means different parts of the nervous system are affected, and they get better. Now, MRI is important too to help us with this diagnosis. The reason it can help us is when we do a MRI, it is like a history sheet of a, what's happened to a patient's nervous system. So if uh, I or you fell down at five years of age from a stool and were completely normal, our uh, MRI may show a hemorrhage in the brain which will be seen forever. So uh, MRI, when we do a MRI in a given point of time, it will show us lesions which have happened any time in our life. And we, there's a way to grade them by you know seeing them across different sequences. That's where the MRI takes one hour is to say approximately this has happened years ago, months ago or in the last few days. And what is really important as a neurologist and as a patient is to know if something has happened recently. Because in MS, if you talk of MS, if something has happened recently, you want to be back to us. If something has happened in the remote past, you want to then sit quietly, discuss the TMP and other things. So what we do is we give a contrast, it's a dye, which a radiologist finish most of the MRI, they give a dye, which is quite expensive, but they give it, now wherever there is an active plaque, that area becomes leaky, because there is no blood brain barrier, otherwise the brain is very inflated. It's a country on its own, it doesn't allow other people to enter. So when you give a dye and there is a plaque which is actively inflamed and the inflammation is going on, the dye leaks. So you see that thing enhancing or you see a shadow or a crown of contrast around that lesion. So a person's brain may have 10 lesions of plaques in the brain, but if one of them or two of them are enhancing on contrast, which is called post-contrast, means after the contrast, that means that is a recent or a new lesion. That means if you don't have MS, go ahead and take pulse steroids. So that's why the MRI is done before contrast for a long time. Then a contrast is given and then they wait and keep taking more images. So that's for post contrast. Yeah, thank you everyone. Let me now uh, introduce a person who needs no introduction. This is Shiva Chinnis, co-founder of Multiple Sclerosis Society of India. She is the person who spearheaded uh, the MS awareness uh, for the last 30, 37 years in the country. She is a recipient of multiple awards at state level and national level. So MS Society would not be what it is without Mrs. Sheila Jekness.
to manage their image much better than now. Dear Dr. Bhuj, we at MSS and Mumbai chapter are immensely grateful to you for organizing this seminar and chairing the session. I remember at my request Dr. Bhuj had already organized two excellent seminars earlier at KDA, KDA and this is the third one. And fourth one is coming next year. <laughs> Once again, Dr. Bhatt and the management of KDA, we extend our grateful thanks to you. Also, thank you for your educative talk and management of working in it. I offer my sincere thanks to Dr. Rekha Bhakkhande, co-chairing for this session. Dr. Rekha is at, at the moment tremendously busy with her affairs with Chuchurita Hospital, yet she agreed to come to come as a message is very dear to her. Very great, Dr. Rekha. Thank you, Dr. Bhakkhande. Part of yes, and you should be you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Anu Akhavar, who has been with us many times, all the times I think, whenever I come. Thank you. Dr. Adarwal for explaining about the latest therapy in MS in the which is the need of our work and answering so many questions. So many questions patient. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Hotspot. Uh, during pandemic years, she continued her free online classes for MSPs from all over India, which is still going on. And are now under the training together, totally sessions at it. And she is always talking something differently. That's why she is very popular among all our uh, MSPs or th throughout all the chat. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dusty. My angel is a radiant smile. That's what I call it. All right. Dr. Abhishek Srivastava, who is a Putin? Come, come, come. Thank you, Dr. Srivastava, for your guidance necessary for all different patients. And I would like to share your equipment, which, which will be useful for me in personal use. Okay. Now I offer, uh, I offer my sincere thanks to the sponsors, Intel Pharmaceutical. Is there any Thank you. Yeah. 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 And we want to thank MSSI for hosting this 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.